Welcome to the University of Nottingham podcast. Hello and welcome back to the University of Nottingham podcast. In this episode, we're going to be talking about what everyone else is talking about, the inauguration of Barack Obama and the subsequent global euphoria. But with expectations so high, Professor Peter Ling from the School of American and Canadian Studies questions the international reaction to the president-elect. The world itself needs to shed the idea that Barack Obama has been elected to lead the world. He's been elected to lead the United States. Is it a case of euphoria or actually relief? Part of the sheer euphoria that is surrounding this inauguration is as much about GW's departure as it is about Obama's arrival. And picking up where George W. Bush left off. I mean, the in-tray for President Obama <laughs> is just a frightening spectacle. Really starting off with your own interest in, in, a, in this particular area, this couldn't be more pertinent to you really, given your expertise in research into Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement. Yeah. Um, firstly, your overall thoughts ahead of, ahead of the inauguration. Right, well clearly it is a historic inauguration. Barack Obama is a president unlike any we have seen before. He does carry with him these extraordinary hopes, not just from African Americans as the first black president, but really on a, on a kind of constituency of uh, liberal Democrats who see him as somebody very different from the kind of Democrats that have been elected really since the 1960s. So if you think of people like Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton, they were both Southern Democrats who were relatively conservative, particularly in practical policy matters. And so Obama is coming in as a Northern Democrat and somebody who reflects a new enthusiasm for some degree of state intervention. At least that's how he's perceived within that faction of his own party. So there's extraordinary hopes attached to him. The other thing that is, I think, distinctive about him from the democratic point of view is his oratory. Not since Kennedy have we had a democratic politician who is so consummately the public speaker. And he's arguably better than Kennedy. Kennedy is better remembered than he was actually experienced. And his, um, his delivery style with this very clipped Boston accent actually irritated some people at the time. Whereas clearly Obama has this wonderful voice uh, and is likened to the great orators. He's likened to Martin Luther King. He's likened to Franklin Roosevelt in terms of uh, the kind of enthusiasm and, and, um, and hope that he generates in the American people. The inauguration itself is also a bit Kennedy-like in, um, in the sense that it's likely to be a cold day this Tuesday. And so there will be uh, kind of lots of people shivering in the cold whilst the oaths are taken. And it'll be interesting to see if they have the kind of walk down the, the uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, which is something that certainly Jimmy Carter did, and how they deal with the crowd. So it's going to be an important event. Uh, the other thing that is clearly significant is that um, the entire world seems to have become Obama fans. Um, yeah, That is something that um, certainly hasn't been the case for the present incumbent. Uh, <laughs> but not by any means. Not by any means. And whilst I think we were t saying earlier that clearly part of the sheer euphoria that is surrounding this inauguration is as much about GW's departure as it is about Obama's arrival. Um, it's hard, possibly only Richard Nixon departed office as ignominiously as uh, George Bush is going to depart office. People just can't wait for him to leave the building. And that has added to the sense that uh, Obama is, is a breath of fresh air and somebody who's going to redeem America's fortunes both nationally and internationally. The sense of euphoria, um, as you say, it's global. Mm. Quite frightening, actually. It, I mean, it, it is. Some of it's, it's really over the top in some, some news reports, depending on which sources you're reading. Yes, I think um, collectively, given that we live in this kind of media village and building on, to some extent on his extraordinary abilities as an orator and as a, a kind of creature of the television age, there is 
a sense in which progressive forces, as they would characterize themselves, see him as somebody who is going to uh, undo the mistakes of the Bush administration, who is going to be a force for peace in the Middle East, in the, in the larger region, who is going to make America rely on diplomacy rather than force, who's also going to deal with the enormous economic challenges that face the world in a way that somehow is miraculous and fair. Perhaps the most distressing thing about the international reaction to Barack Obama is that they see this American president as somehow president of the world. You, d you do get that sense. We don't, get, we, we don't have that system. Not only can he not um, afford to be seen too much as somehow following the interests of a larger world order, but the world itself needs to shed the idea that Barack Obama has been elected to lead the world. He's been elected to lead the United States, and I think it will soon become clear that he does have challenges on the domestic front that require him to take steps that will be unpopular internationally. I think the recent agreement that America signed with the Israelis about the key terms of any settlement of the Gaza dispute, with underlining the priorities of the Israelis in terms of their own domestic security, that wouldn't have been signed off in the closing days of the Bush administration without a definite nod of approval from the incoming um, Obama regime. And he has made it clear that he is going to um, protect Israel. Uh, his Secretary of State, the previous senator from New York is certainly not going to do anything that will antagonize the Jewish American community. So I think we are unlikely to see anything decisively uh, innovative in Middle Eastern politics from Obama in his first term. Um, he's also on record as saying that uh, whilst the Iraq conflict was a mistake, the fight in Afghanistan needs to be renewed, invigorated, and pushed more uh, emphatically. So where he's opposed the surge in Iraq, he's actually prepared to endorse a surge in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we are going to see measures taken by Obama that begins to dent this image of him as somehow the benign leader of the entire world. <laughs> On that point, I mean, the pressure at the moment on him must be immense. The expectations, yeah. I can't think of a possibly a single person in public life who, who's had this level of expectation placed on him. Absolutely. I think it's extraordinary. I, one of the things that you have to respect about the man is that despite the extraordinary pressures placed upon him, he does appear to display what Hemingway called grace under pressure. He has this ability to appear in public composed, cool, charming, thoughtful, and extraordinarily articulate. Uh, his advisors, and of course they are going to say that, aren't they, say how it, he is the one who remains calm in every situation when they become angry or confused. And of all the things that he's going to have to maintain, this ability to remain calm at the center of the storm is going to be probably the one that stands him in best stead. Again, the worry is that if you look at what he's actually done politically, he has tended to be very pragmatic, he's tended to be a centrist, and so he will go with what is a safe option. I don't think we will see too many radical measures from Barack Obama. And that will inevitably mean that some of the expectations that have been generated are going to be disappointed. Um, it will be interesting, for example, how far during his first term he will be prepared to take measures to seriously reduce America's energy consumption. It will be interesting to see whether he makes any progress on delivering universal health care to Americans. These are the kinds of bold measures that gained him enthusiastic support during the campaign. But in the context of the worst depression since the 1930s, Americans losing their jobs, 
the Dow taking another dive this last week and continuing uh, involvement in at least one conflict, a very difficult withdrawal to occur from Iraq, and dangers both in terms of the former Soviet states, where the, the issue with the Ukraine is something he's going to have to be involved in. Or the gas in. supplies. The gas yeah. supplies, and equally the, the Gaza situation. I mean, the intray for President Obama <laughs> is just a frightening spectacle. Um, and he commands my utmost respect just for being prepared to take the job. Um, it's been often reported the American presidency has become an impossible job. But he does appear to have so many things pressing him immediately that the idea that he will be able to undertake things that fundamentally reshape the future and I think the Observer this weekend was saying he's got four years to save the planet because of the severity of the uh, potential global climate change issue. If that were true, then I'm afraid we're in a very dangerous situation indeed because no American president is likely to achieve a radical restructuring of the American economy in terms of energy in any four-year cycle. Particularly um, in this and particularly Current in this climate, one, surely. Um, you know, oil prices are now falling, the level of economic activity is falling, consequently the pressures that were there last summer with uh, the $4, four dollar gallon uh, frightening Americans to the real cost of energy, that's been taken away again. Um, so although prices are a concern, they are not quite the hot issue, uh, the unemployment and uh, regenerating growth, you know, the kind of multiplier effect of increasing spending, easing credit, doing everything we can to promote economic activity. That's something that's very difficult to meld onto an ecological program that is designed to make us less taxing on the planet. I think Obama is going to be far more interested in saving American jobs than he will be in saving the planet in the first two years, certainly, of his administration. The big day for the civil rights movement, obviously going yeah. back to Martin Luther King, and I mean, one of the, the big areas of research for you is social action and its importance in for groups like the civil rights movement. Yeah, and I think it's it's been interesting to see how Obama initially, during the campaign, had a certain ambivalence about his relationship with the civil rights movement. He felt that if he embraced them too tightly, he would be just another black candidate. And the problem, we, as anybody would, uh, any black politician would explain to you, is that African Americans constitute 13% of the population. There is no way you are going to win the presidency simply with the African American vote. So he had to break out from that, and he had to see himself far more as the candidate of change than the candidate of the civil rights movement. So certainly through the, um, the critical period of the campaign, particularly with the um, Jeremiah Wright incident in which he had to distance himself from his own pastor and make the speech about race, he has positioned himself as somebody who is not just a black American who must therefore stand on the shoulders of the heroes of the civil rights movement like Martin Luther King. As somebody who studied Martin Luther King, I obviously watch every Obama speech waiting for the reference to Dr. King, which usually comes, but what's nice about him is that he tends to do it slightly indirectly. So yesterday at the festivities on the Mall, he was talking about the King who spoke across the Mall um, without kind of referencing him completely. I thought that he didn't completely embrace the civil rights movement as his uh, foundation until the victory celebrations. And at that point, he was prepared to see himself as somehow an extension of Dr. King's dream. The other side of this is that the civil rights movement itself has a slightly ambivalent relationship with African Americans today. Because if you think of the, the kind of classic images of the civil rights movement, if they are celebratory images, they are images of black and white together, they're images of the thousands at the Lincoln Memorial. 
actually, when you think about the issues that African Americans face in terms of job discrimination, police brutality, they're likely to be the ones who have the poorest credit rating and therefore are going to be most impacted by the credit crunch. These foreclosures of homes that we're hearing about are disproportionately of minority homeowners. Those issues are the things that King tried to address in the last two years of his life and did so with very little success at all. He was far too radical mm -hmm. for America's political economy to accept. He was a social democrat, a socialist, and that was not something that was realistic in the American system. So to that extent, the civil rights movement had a second agenda that has never really been fulfilled, and a very tough one to fulfill within the American context. The politicians, the African-American politicians who've come forward, have had to kind of tailor themselves to the possibles of American life. And that has tended to mean that they have uh, defended entitlement programs for the most part, uh, but they've also wanted to push the possibilities of regulation to ensure meritocracy. So affirmative action for them means that you try to remove the obstacles to the employment of African Americans across the board. But in effect, what you tend to do is accentuate the advantages for well-educated, privileged African Americans of the middle class and thereby, to some extent, widen the gulf inside the African American community. So, um, to some extent, Barack Obama represents the African American community that did benefit from the civil rights movement, but benefited in a way that would ultimately make it harder for them to connect with their brothers who didn't benefit and push the radical agenda that the second wave of the civil rights movement did. Barack Obama is kind of more a reflection of the Oprah generation than he is of the uh, Martin Luther King generation. But the civil rights movement made this possible. That is, without a doubt, it would not have been possible to imagine Barack Obama becoming President of the United States in the 1950s when Martin Luther King emerged as a civil rights leader. Um, to some extent, I think one of the things we have to fight against is that we know the story so much and it seems so much as somehow a fulfillment of America's promise that people get into a sense of inevitability about it. And it was far from inevitable. It was a desperate struggle. You've been listening to the University of Nottingham podcast. Some of the music in this show has been supplied by the Podshow Podsafe Music Network. That's music.podshow.com. If you'd like to comment on this or any other podcast you've heard, you can add a message on iTunes or simply drop me a line at andrew.burden at nottingham.ac.uk. Thanks for listening. <laughs>